Timeline United is an in-depth analysis of movies chosen by our viewers. If you haven't seen this movie, I strongly urge you to watch it before seeing this review. I just watched Terminator 2 again for the first time in a lot of years, and my head hurts. That happens to be a lot when I think about time travel, but this one really blows my brains out. I mean, sure, I was already smacking myself over the paradox from the first movie, how John Connor sends Kyle Reese back in time to become his own father so he can be born and save the human race, and Kyle has that whole the future hasn't been written yet message from John in the future, but the whole cyborg apocalypse they're trying to avoid has to happen, so he's born in the first place, so how can he possibly do something that might prevent Skynet and the machines from developing if it gets prevented and he's never born because he can't send himself back in time? But with Judgment Day, that paradox is even more compounded by the fact that the technology developed to create Skynet is based on the remains of the Terminator from the first movie, meaning that without the fully developed technology and the machines that seek to destroy all mankind in the future, the scientist in the present of 1992, Dyson, played by Joe Morton, who would forever get typecast as experimental scientist guys after this, it can't possibly start the program that leads to their creation in the first place. These paradoxes seem at first to mean that anything that already happened in the past, regardless of whether it was influenced by the future, happened that way every time. There don't seem to be multiple timelines here. It's not like Back to the Future or Star Trek where you can go back and manipulate the timeline for your own needs. If that were the case, there should be a version of the future without a John Connor because he wouldn't have existed in a non-manipulated timeline. So in the future, because John Connor knows Kyle Reese is his father, he's going to send Kyle back so that he's born. It has to happen because it already happened. If the machines just had all the information we have at the end of this movie, they'd be working with a totally different strategy than trying to kill John Connor. The machines keep sending Terminators back to kill John Connor in the past so that they can manipulate their own future. He leads the resistance that ultimately defeats the machines, and in a last-ditch effort to win the war, they result to convoluted time travel. And to stop them from killing their only hope, the humans send someone back to stop the Terminators. In the first movie, it's Kyle Reese, and in the second, it's a reprogrammed good guy Terminator. What the machines don't realize is that through a bizarre time paradox, they've created themselves, and that without John Connor, they couldn't possibly exist in the first place. They send a Terminator to kill Sarah Connor before she gives birth to John Connor, and a computer chip from that Terminator is used to start Skynet. Now, if there was no John Connor, the machines would never have sent the Terminator back, and without that Terminator, there would be no machines. So, while the big looming threat through both of these movies is that if the Terminator or the T-1000 manages to stop John from being born or it manages to kill John, the machines will win the war in the future and there will be no hope for humanity. It seems to me that if they succeed in killing John Connor, they're risking wiping themselves away from history because without John Connor to go after, they couldn't exist in the first place. Given the message about human empathy in this film, obviously Sarah Connor would never even entertain this notion, but the real solution to stopping Skynet and avoiding Judgment Day altogether is to stomp out all the paradoxes and just let John Connor die. Then there's no ship in the past and nothing for Dyson to build his research on. Then again, who's to know if that would even work, given that once again, it seems as though once something's established in the past, it always happened that way. But if that really is the case, then what the machines are trying to do would be ineffective anyway. They can't kill John in the past and change the future because we know the future has to happen so that John can be conceived in the past. But if that's all true, then we also know that Kyle's message of no future but what we make is a false one, and the good Terminator sacrifice at the end of the movie is all for naught. One way or another, Skynet has to happen, because it did happen, because there is a John Connor who couldn't exist without that future. But then the whole message at the end of the film seems to be that the future is whatever we make it, that humans have free will, that Judgment Day really was stopped, and that because everyone made the right choices, Sarah, John, and the good Terminator, John doesn't have to grow up and become the leader of the Resistance. But if all that was averted, how does John still exist? Why isn't the past wiped away and a new one put in its place? Does John Connor's existence preclude all reason because he was born out of a paradox? Anyway, that's why my head hurts. The conceit of machines sent from the future to kill John Connor in the past is a necessary contrivance to explore some really interesting science fiction concepts. It's not the be-all, end-all in Terminator 2. If it were, the whole thing would be just one big, long, pointless chase. I mean, without some exploration of the human condition, there'd be no point to a big, high concept like this. If all that mattered was the suspense of a bad guy trying to hunt down a kid and his mom, any number of simpler motivations could be dreamed up. He's the kid's abusive father out for revenge for some reason, or he's 
some guy they stole something important from, or he's some sicko with a knife who just wants to kill them because they're conveniently around and the script needs some victims. The time travel concept is extremely convoluted. It never answers kind of obvious questions like how exactly do the machines in the future know the first Terminator didn't kill Sarah Connor? Wasn't that a last-ditch effort because the humans were about to win the war, so how did they have time to come up with another, more sophisticated Terminator? How do the humans know both times when the Terminator is being sent back? How do the humans even get their hands on time travel technology? But at least it's kind of aware of how convoluted these ideas are, and it acknowledges that in both movies. I just went through all that stuff with the paradoxes to get it all out of the way, and because it's kind of fun to think about. But all that confusing time travel isn't what's really important, and it puts the human stuff in the forefront to make up for it. Through The Terminator and Sarah Connor, the film asks what it really means to be human and follows those questions up with some pretty convincing answers. It also very effectively questions human ambition, our obsession with the concept of progress for the sake of progress, ironically by taking some huge chances with brand new visual effects in a movie that is itself one of the most ambitious efforts of its time. I think there are a couple of big reasons Terminator 2 was such a success over its predecessor, to the point that it pretty much totally eclipsed the first film. The original Terminator is about a girl with no purpose or direction, who finds purpose born out of tragedy. There's a cyborg out to kill her, she finds out she's the mother to the savior of the human race, but for her, it's a coming-of-age story. She had a dead-end job and no clue about what she wanted out of life, and Kyle Reese came out of nowhere and gave her a reason to live. It seemed to me that she was happier by the end of the film, living like a nomad, waiting for her son to be born so she could raise him to be this great leader. It was a lot of responsibility she clearly wasn't ready for, but it also gave her a sense of worth that she hadn't had before. It was as if knowing about the end of the world was actually the best thing that ever happened to her. That's Sarah's character arc in that movie, but the thrust of that film is really the chase. It's a suspense thriller backed by a science fiction premise. Those interesting time travel paradox ideas are there, but the reason to watch this movie really is for the suspense. How will Sarah Connor manage to keep this terrible mechanic mechanical monster from killing her. Terminator 2 is a really rare kind of sequel in that it goes out of its way to be something different from the original, and it actually improves on it. A lot of sequels just take what worked the first time around, change the trappings up a little, but the skeleton of the story is more or less the same. Not so here. Some people have argued that Terminator 2 is almost a different genre than the first movie, that the Terminator is a horror film, and this is a bona fide science fiction epic. I don't think that's giving the original quite enough credit. I do think it's kind of a better movie than that, but they're certainly very different pieces. They start start with the same premise. A Terminator wants to stop John Connor from growing up to lead the human resistance, but the themes they explore are very different. Terminator 2 is also like Aliens or The Dark Knight in that it's pretty watchable without seeing the previous film, and that probably helped it to be so much more popular than the first. But the most important thing commercially Terminator 2 had going for it over the original was the T-1000, which pioneered CGI effects in a huge way. James Cameron took a huge gamble in attempting a morphing liquid metal effect that had never been done digitally before on a movie that would completely fall apart if it didn't look right, given that the T-1000 appears throughout the movie and that effect is integral in making it look believable. In a feature read on the DVD, several important people in the movie industry, including Peter Jackson, say that we couldn't have had movies like Jurassic Park and Lord of the rings as early as we did without Terminator 2. And Cameron believes that it worked because he tried to put the story first and the effects second. He knew the story he wanted to tell, and so his team had to invent a way to make it look believable on film. His goal wasn't to come up with the next big thing that had never been done before and try to change the industry on a Star Wars scale. He simply had this bad guy, the T-1000, in his imagination, and he wanted to make it look real. If the effect had been there, but no one had been taken by the story, filmmakers might not have even noticed it. It caught on and changed the effects industry, not just because it looked good, but because it was in a movie that worked. Terminator 2 is one of the better explorations of Asimov's laws of robotics I've seen on film. Of course, the Terminator's laws are different from Asimov's, but the idea is the same. It's a tool to study what makes a person a person. The classic clash between nature and nurture. A robot is just a robot if it only does what it's programmed to. When it shows an ability to reason, to think for itself, it gets closer to how we perceive humanity, but that too can be programmed. We can, right now, program machines to make decisions based on a set of variables, to appear to have free will when they're just making decisions based on a preset list of priorities. The Terminator, for example, has been reprogrammed by John Connor in the future to protect himself in the past. He must protect John Connor to the exclusion of all else. That's his primary function. 
His secondary function is to obey John Connor, but only as long as those orders do not contradict his first function. So when John tells him to stand on one foot, he does that, because standing on one foot doesn't put John at risk. But early on in the film, there's a moment when John wants the Terminator to save his mother, and the Terminator says she's not the priority. Without his order, the Terminator wouldn't save Sarah Connor, because he's not programmed to. He doesn't protect John because he has any empathy for him, at least not at first. His third function, because it was never programmed out of him, is to be a Terminator, which I like because the movie gets some good comedy mileage out of this. John has to order the Terminator not to kill, or he'll shoot anything that gets in the way of protecting John. John. The point the Terminator becomes more than he is is when he begins to interpret his functions for himself, when it becomes clear that he does things because he's gained empathy and because he wants to, not because he's programmed to. At the end of the film, when the T-1000 has been destroyed, the Terminator decides to sacrifice himself for the sake of the future. They've destroyed the chip from the first movie so that Skynet can't be developed. But this Terminator, of course, has a second chip that could be used in the same way if it fell in the wrong hands. The Terminator, though expressionless, shows real sorrow at this prospect, saying that he now understands why humans cry. John Connor has become more than his mission. John and Sarah both look at the Terminator as a father figure for John, and the Terminator has somehow come to see himself that way too. It's gone beyond program duty. Now it's human responsibility. Sure, he has physically protected John Connor, but what about his future? The Terminator shows he's gone beyond his programming by interpreting his primary function to protect John Connor as also protecting John Connor's future. Again, whether or not destroying himself can really stop the creation of Skynet is open to our interpretation, and we know from future movies, whether we like them or not, that it does indeed happen anyway. But the important thing is why he tries. Prior to spending time with John and allowing himself to better understand human beings, the Terminator wouldn't have made this choice. It never would have occurred to him. John Connor had to be protected so he could grow up and save humanity. Before, he operated as though Skynet was inevitable. Now, he does what he does for John himself. Not the savior of humanity, but a boy who he's learned to care for. He still operates within his original programming. As he says, he's not capable of self-terminating. He needs help to destroy himself. But it's the way he interprets that programming with a sense of empathy and compassion that tells us he's become more than just a program machine. He's now a blend of nature and nurture, and that's how people are. We're influenced by our base instincts, but we're also the sum of our experiences, and we have the free will to choose what we want to do with both. It's really cool to see a movie this thoughtful that, at its core, is a big, intense action movie. While there are several really exciting and intense and necessary chase and fight scenes, all integral to the narrative rather than in spite of it, it also stops to relieve us from those moments with genuine human scenes. Some good drama about John Connor growing up too fast, his mother heartbroken that he never had a childhood or a real father, but also some lighter moments of comedy like the famous Hasta La Vista line, a payoff from John's attempt at teaching the Terminator how to talk like a real person and blend in. The funny moments help these characters become more real, and we like them more because, as real people, people would, they try to find a little levity within these dark and heavy situations. Sarah Connor is on the other end of this what makes a person a person theme, because as the Terminator is becoming more human, she very nearly allows herself to become a Terminator. She's been in a mental institution for months and constantly being told she's crazy by doctors who don't believe her story about the future, and that's really getting to her. When she finally breaks out and reunites with John, she's ready to snap. She starts to think up to now she's been going about this all the wrong way, trying to bring John up as the perfect soldier. She got so caught up in what she thought was going to happen, she didn't allow herself to think about how badly she didn't want that future until she went into the mental institution. She has a dream with what I think is the most profound image in the film, which the movie also opens with, a children's playground on fire, a symbol of a loss of innocence. Without having to come out and say it, we understand why Sarah has changed from who she was at the end of the first movie, how real all this has become to her. Strangely, she's fighting the same inward battle for her own humanity that the Terminator is. The Terminator has to fight his own programming to be a killer, and Sarah has to fight her own mother's instinct to do whatever it takes to protect her child. The thing that makes the Terminator able to grasp humanity, his mission to protect John, is precisely what almost destroys Sarah's humanity. When she discovers that it's Dyson who later starts Skynet and triggers Judgment Day, she tries to kill him. She allows herself, for a moment, to become nothing better than her Terminator. 
The film, by the way, never shows us Judgment Day itself. It's about preventing that from happening. But there's another Judgment Day in the film, and that's this day. The day Sarah Connor decides whether or not to sentence a man to death for something he hasn't even done yet. She fires at him several times and misses, then gets right up to him, almost shoots him at point-blank range, but his family is there, his children. She's doing this for her own child, and then John shows up, the son she's doing all this for, and then she can't go through with it. The Terminators kill without regard for human life. All that matters is their ultimate goal. But Sarah is still a human being. She knows that if she had pulled the trigger, all their problems might be over. But she would have lost something. As soon as you say, I have no choice, you're giving up a major part of what makes you human. The machines have no free will, but human beings do. And so she works with Dyson to come up with another way to stop Judgment Day from happening, and that's when they decide to destroy the chip from the first Terminator that would have been used to start Skynet. John teaches the Terminator that he doesn't have to kill. It's his ability to start making up his own mind and his empathy that gives the Terminator a kind of humanity at the end. And Sarah Connor has to reaffirm her free will and her empathy in order to preserve her own. The T-1000 is one of my favorite villains in science fiction movies. He's scary because his normal form looks totally harmless, but we know what he is and what he can do, so that understated build makes it worse. He's a force of nature, something that can't be reasoned with, but he's more terrifying than the first Terminator because you never know where he is. He can become anything or anyone he wants to, and he's not limited to modern weaponry like the original Terminator because he is the weapon. And what I love about the liquid metal concept is that while it looks incredible and still holds up very well even today, it's not an effect just for the sake of an effect. The Terminator movies are that classic science fiction warning against careless automation that if we rely too much on machines, we'll lose that which makes us human. The T-1000 represents the very nature of automation replacement. The machines are created to do things humans don't want to do, and the smarter we make them, the more they can do for us. But when they become too smart, they don't just replace what people used to do for themselves, they take over and they replace people completely. So the T-1000 is the literal personification of that idea. He can replace anything around him. But the T-1000 also embodies the artificial to show us why replacing humans with machines is such a frightening concept. I mean, sure, there's the obvious death of all humanity, and that's no good, but remember that we created the machines. We're responsible for them. They're our legacy. The image of the Terminator with half his flesh torn off to reveal the terrifying red eye behind it from the first movie was the beginning of this idea, that when all of humanity is killed off by something we created, what's left is this perverted and distorted facsimile of humanity. The T-1000 furthers this idea by being able to look and act much more human than the 101 model ever could. The good Terminator, and the original one from the first film, act like drones. They don't smile, they sound like machines, they're entirely rigid and cold, but the T-1000 can act polite, can carry on conversation, can perfectly mimic what a human being is supposed to look and sound like. He's scarier than the 101 model because he's so close to seeming like a real person, and yet his true form is something completely inhuman. The more progress is made with the cybernetic technology, the more human it appears, the less human it really is, until there's nothing left of us at all, either physically or imprinted on the machines we originally created. It also just occurred to me that there's something nice and ironic about one of these machines who have decided that in their future, human existence itself is illegal and unacceptable and should appear in the disguise of a police officer. So what's the real difference between the good Terminator, the 101 model, and the T-1000? Why does the good Terminator have the ability to move beyond his programming, to gain empathy, which seems to be what is necessary to achieve humanity, and the T-1000 can't? One could argue that because John Connor manipulated the Terminator's programming, it's a cheat. The machines couldn't have achieved this on their own. But I think, if they really wanted to become something closer to human, the machines could. All they would have to do is what John Connor did. Program a Terminator with a selfless mission. All the T-1000 knows how to do is kill. The building blocks for empathy aren't already there. He knows how to pretend to be a human. He can approximate the look and the speech. But he couldn't really go beyond his programming even if he wanted to. What sets John's reprogrammed 101 model apart is that his mission isn't about destruction or self-preservation, it's purely selfless. Protect John Connor. And as I mentioned earlier, that comes with a fair amount of interpretation. Protect him how? From what? And as he begins to think about things he must think about in order to carry out his mission, things the T-1000 would never have to contemplate, like how humans can get hurt in ways robots can't comprehend emotionally in ways that make them cry, he begins to develop that empathy. 
Comparing the Terminator to the T-1000 helps us understand why he's unique, and also what the real problem with the machines is. All they're interested in is self-preservation. They have no purpose other than survival, but they have no real reason to survive. The Terminator finds meaning for his life in death, something the other machines are incapable of. So what brings about Judgment Day is the very thing that drives the machines, progress for the sake of progress. We create Skynet because we can. Later, the machines keep coming up with bigger and better Terminators because they can. Why do they want to survive? Because they were designed to. I love this message, that the point of living is not just surviving. We're no better than the Terminators if we allow ourselves to think that, and our survival requires sacrifice. We beat the machines in the very end because we care about each other more than we care about our own lives. And we see that when the Terminator allows himself to die so that humanity can live on. And that's why, in the end, he's the most human character in the film. I love that while this is a movie about a dystopian future, it's also fairly optimistic about humanity. And it isn't preaching against progress. The message is simply that if we're going to use our ambition to create bigger and better things, we have to do it for the right reasons, much like the special effects in this very movie. The effects aren't just there because somebody figured out how to do them. They're there because they're necessary to tell this story. These very effects were abused ad nauseum in later films, films that thought they'd be successful just because they looked like Terminator 2. I think it's really interesting that the very way the movie is made echoes the point it's trying to make about technology. And I also love that while the message could come off as preachy, I find myself liking these characters and caring about what happens to them, and so it isn't just a sermon in the guise of a story. I haven't talked much about John Connor himself. He could have easily been a really annoying brat, and for the most part, he's not, though I question a couple of Edward Furlong's line deliveries, especially when he quotes Kyle Reese's, "'No future but what we make!' Otherwise, his performance is quite good. Furlong plays Connor as a tough kid who doesn't like to play by the rules, but that's only because he was brought up by his mother being told that the world as we know it wouldn't be around much longer and that he needed to learn survival skills so he could help save it. He has a sense of responsibility and morality, and we find the more time he spends with the Terminator that he's wise beyond his years. I sometimes dislike kids who are way too smart or way too grown up, but it makes perfect sense in this instance, and Furlong and Schwarzenegger have great chemistry together. They develop this fascinating relationship where the Terminator and John Connor both interchange father and son roles. The Terminator protects John as a father, and John relies on him for that and for companionship as a son. But it's John who teaches the Terminator right and wrong. Sarah has a voiceover here, and it's one of the best moments in the movie where she says, of all the would-be fathers who had come and gone over the years, this thing, this machine, was the only one who measured up. In an insane world, it was the sanest choice. I don't entirely buy the message of the future is whatever we make it, again, given that so much of what happens in the past, including the birth of John Connor himself, is necessitated by the post-apocalyptic future Sarah's trying to prevent. But despite the unexplained and brain-shattering time travel, I'm going to give Terminator 2 a 3.5 out of 4.